Um, so th this is an interesting little talk. Um, I've never given it. Uh, I, I been speak. I try not to repeat any talks. I'll go back five years and, and redo a five-year-old talk because by then there's enough information to update it. Um, I wanted to give a very simple lecture on the pressure-controlled breaths and uh, contrast them. So my catchy title is Pressure Control is to Pressure Regulated Volume Control as What is to Volume Support. That's my catchy title. Those of you that know as much or more than I do uh, about mechanical, basic mechanical ventilator graphics, um, maybe you can get an idea about the best way to teach it to your residents and students and trainees. So I recommend characterizing ventilator breaths based on two variables. The controlling variable, which is when the inspiratory valve opens, what is set to make the air move into the patient. And there are only two for traditional breaths. And that's either you directly set a flow 40, 60, 80 liters, so when the inspiratory valve opens, you've got a flow set, or you directly set a pressure that you get immediately by pressurization at the inspiratory valve, and their flow moves based on a pressure gradient. And the other is cycling mechanism, which is what tells the inspiratory valve to close, the breath is over, and open the expiratory valve. And the best way to characterize and contrast different breaths is their controlling and their cycling mechanism. So with that in mind, before we, we do pressure control delivery, let's look at its opposite, the flow control breaths, volume control, is flow controlled and volume cycled, and that's why you have a flat flow because that's the control that's pushing the breath in. And you have a slowly rising pressure until you reach a peak at the end inspiration because all of your measurements are made out near the ventilator. And if you have 40 liters of flow, it's just flying into the lung and you get no pressure buildup until you go into inspiration and you begin to get impediment to the flow and the pressure rises near the ventilator. And that's why you get that pressure waveform and that flow waveform. So now let's talk about the pressure controlled breaths. And the first one, I'm gonna talk about pressure control. Now, why this particular pressure control breath was lucky to get called pressure control, um, who knows? Uh, the English language is funny. Uh, but a pressure control breath is pressure controlled and time cycled. So in, with, with a volume breath, the inspiratory valve uh, closes when you achieve a set tidal volume and the expiratory valve opens. This has a preset time. This is contrasting a volume flow control breath and a pressure control breath, the pressure control breath. And here you can see that when the inspiratory valve opens, there's an immediate pressurization at the inspiratory valve. It's a flat pressure waveform and the gradient between whatever that higher pressure is at the start of inspiration and what's in the patient at the start of inspiration, which is the end expiratory pressure, determines flow based on a pressure gradient, and then you get a decelerating inspiratory waveform uh, because as the pressure 
gradient as the flow goes into the patient the pressure goes up in the patient and the gradient for flow decreases and your inspiratory flow falls off Uh, this um, is just another uh, pictorial. Uh, this shows you the inspiratory valve open, and there's an immediate pressurization. That's the inspiratory valve, and it's maintained. So you have 35 here and 5 here at the start of inspiration. And if you have 35 and 5, you get a lot of flow. Here's a lot of flow. And then as the inspiration goes on, this pressure rises in the patient and flow drops off. And here, this is the inspiratory flow waveform above the x-axis. You can see that it reached zero flow, reaching the x-axis, prior to the end of inspiration. And that's because there is a preset inspiratory time on a pressure control breath. So if you achieve the same pressure inside and outside the patient before that prescripted uh, eye time, it'll just sit there with the same pressure inside and outside the patient. In contrast to this inspiratory waveform uh, where you see it started out with the high pressure but you still have flow at the end of inspiration, which means that the pressure in your patient is still less than the pressure that you have pressurized at the inspiratory valve, so you still have flow. If you prolong the eye time in this patient, you'll get no more tidal volume. If you prolong the tidal volume in this circumstance, you will get more tidal volume. So a pressure control breath is pressure control time cycle. It has two independent variables, time and pressure. Uh, those are preset, they'll be the same every single breath. And its dependent variables are flow and volume. So the flow will be determined by the downstream pressure, and the downstream pressure will change with any change in resistance, any change in elastance, or any change in inspiratory effort. Which means one of my favorite teaching tools is to walk into a post-op patient put them on pressure control when I see that they're, they're comfortable, they're gonna be extubated soon. I, I say, excuse me, I have some students or fellows or residents, uh, do you mind uh, if I show them something with a ventilator? And, you know, okay, and I, I just set it on pressure control and I let them adjust in. And then we look at the tidal volume they're getting and the patient is content not a lot of not a lot of variability in inspiratory effort. Their resistance is not changing, their elastance is not changing. And I say, excuse me, sir, would you take some big breaths? And they take some big efforts and the tidal volume goes up. And we don't normally think of how a patient can affect tidal volume on pressure control because they don't control eye time. And we'll talk about a breath a little bit later, another pressure control breath where they do have influence on eye time and it does make a difference in the variability of inspiratory effort. So this is another um, pressure control breath. I'm not showing you the pressure. Uh, I'm just showing you here uh, the same point I made earlier with a different graphic. Uh, if you prolong the eye time in this patient, uh, you continue to get flow and you get a bigger tidal volume. A patient recovering from acute respiratory distress syndrome is receiving pressure assist control ventilation and is triggering all of the ventilator breaths. An upper endoscopy is required to evaluate new bleeding in the upper gastrointestinal tract, and a neuromuscular blocker is administered to facilitate this procedure. 
the ventilator graphics abruptly change, what is the best explanation for the change in graphics? So this is the flow before and after the paralysis. This is the volume before and after, and this is the pressure. Now this is a pressure control breath. So the pressure level is not gonna change, the eye time is not gonna change, so there's no way we would see any difference in these two. But the tidal volume has gone down, and it looks like the flow has decreased if you compare these two. So why did the flow go down and the tidal volume go down? It's because he stopped taking inspiratory effort and therefore the downstream pressure, pressure for pressure gradient for flow went up because it was, he had the negative pull that now he didn't. So now I want to introduce the concept of open loop and closed loop. Open loop is the way all ventilators used to be, uh, meaning that you set the ventilator and then whatever happened, happened, and the ventilator could only give, it could not receive. And now ventilators have the capability, the computers, to receive information and make adjustments based on data that they're getting from the patient. And that's called closed loop, and it used to be open loop. And that's a nice way to introduce the difference between pressure control and pressure regulated volume control that we, the name we have in English, or pressure control volume guarantee. Uh, but they're, it's the same principle. The principle is you use a standard pressure control breath and you measure each exhale tidal volume and you allow the ventilator to go up on the applied pressure if the target tidal volume decreases and you allow it to go up on the applied pressure uh, if the target tidal volume decreases, the computer goes up. If it increases, it goes down. So it's an attempt to try to keep the tidal volume you want with a pressure control breath. The concept was developed to handle sudden changes in patient condition. If a patient got a mucus plug in the endo, or began to get a mucus plug in the tracheal, uh, tube, if they started going into some pulmonary edema, or if their pulmonary edema suddenly got better or anything got better or worse with resistance and elastance, instead of the, the tidal volume would go up or down briefly and the ventilator would adjust to hold that tidal volume. It, day in, day out, if you go into a patient on pressure regulated volume control, you see inspiratory variability. If you stand there and look at it, it goes 20, 22, 21, 19, 18, 20, 20, 21. There, the change is because of variable patient inspiratory effort, which affects the, tid the tidal volume and that change is just related to variability of inventory effort, which wasn't why it was originally developed. And in fact, that can work against you. Uh, I saw Neil showing the H1N1 uh, slides, and you know I can remember uh, during the H1N1 epidemic, uh, we had some young, healthy patients that had big, Bella's, a lot of strength, and their brains were scrambled from their influenza. And uh, you, you absolutely could not use one of these closed loop pressure control uh, breathing approach on them because they had so much variability uh, over time with their inspiratory effort. So the computer would see a small tidal volume, ratchet up the pressure, and then they take a deep breath and then the pressure, the volume would go real high and then, oh my God, the computer would say and it drop. And if you go in there, you see pressures going up and down. You see tidal volumes going from a liter to 90 cc's. And you, you, you either had to sedate them and use pressure control or use volume. 
The left panel, I'm going to show you figure A, shows stable baseline graphics in a mechanically ventilated patient. A pneumothorax develops and the graphics change occurs on the right panel, figure B, what is the mode. So here we have baseline and then we have a pneumothorax that develops here. And you see that the pressure goes up and then it goes up again and the tidal volume goes up and then it goes up again and the flow goes up again. So the flow went down and then up and up, tidal volume went down and then up and up and then the pressure uh, stayed the same and then it went up and up. And so this is a nice example of how a pressure regulated volume control uh, reacts to what, what it's intended to react to, which is a change in the pathophysiology of the patient. So first time, before you can answer this question, um, how many of you have used volume support? Maybe a couple. We have volume support. I have one attending that loves volume support. Uh, but I can't tell you, uh, I have to tell you the answer now before I tell you about volume support because after I sent Juan the titles, I realized that I had aligned this on my title different than I wanted to present it. So the answer is pressure support. So I told you I was only talking about pressure control breaths. So now we're going to go to another pressure control breath that is an open loop and it has a different cycling mechanism. Uh, you can see it's a pressure control breath, flat pressure. That's what's moving the breath in with the pressure gradient, a decreased inspiratory flow waveform but now it only comes down to 25% flow. And it'll always come down to 25% flow because that's how it cycles. It cycles by when it gets to 25% of the initial peak flow, it cycles. Pressure control, flow cycle. And patients can influence this. So if, if I want to keep my flow up, with a pressure support breath, then all I have to do is breathe deeper and longer and keep that inspiratory pressure going in my pleural space to keep that pressure down with that upstream pressure and keep that flow up and say, stay away from 25%, stay away, stay away. And I'll keep getting flow because when it hits 25, the valve closes, I don't get any more flow. So that's how pressure support works. It's pressure uh, control flow cycle. Um, and this is what it looks like if you have a patient that's taking a lot of inspiratory variability. Uh, here they took a deeper breath and so it went all the way up to the flow limit. Here they took a shallow breath, the peak inspiratory flow is a lot smaller. Uh, they sustained it longer, they stayed off that 25% longer and tidal volume stayed up. Uh, here's a, just a showing the same thing. Uh, independent variables for pressure support pressure. That's all. Everything else is a dependent variable. Patient can vary all of them, uh, can vary eye time, can vary flow, can vary tidal volume. So it's an interesting breath because the only thing that's set in stone is pressure, uh, which is a nice intro. Uh, but pressure support, I think I just covered that. So, uh, which is a nice in, in, intro to volume support because pressure support is to volume support as pressure control is to pressure regulated volume control. This is the closed loop 
pressure support breath that is allowed to vary applied pressure based on measured exhaled tidal volume. So here, um, and this is probably a cartoon example, uh, but here you see uh, that you've set a, a tidal volume and the exhale tidal volume here is not met, uh, so the pressure is incremented up until it reaches that tidal volume uh, as long as it doesn't go above a maximum ventilator set pressure limit. Um, why would you want a mode like this? Um, you probably don't want it so much for maintenance, uh, but my colleague that uses it all the time, uh, she likes it for weaning. Because not only will it go up if the tidal volume is decreased, but if the tidal volume goes up, it'll go down. So it works out uh, as a weaning mechanism, and you can go say, how's my patient doing? What's that pressure? Is it coming down? Uh, you know, are they making progress? Are they taking more of their inspiratory effort on? So to summarize those four pressure control breath, pressure control is pressure control, time cycle, open loop, pressure regulated volume control, pressure control, time cycle, closed loop, pressure support, pressure control, flow cycle, open loop, and volume support, pressure control, flow cycle, closed loop. I only had one last thing. I, anybody here use volume assured pressure support? It's a crazy breath. Anybody here ever used it? I'm going to show it to you. You know, just, just show and tell. It, it's used more with non-invasive ventilation and more for patients with neuromuscular disease. Um, and I don't even know why anybody ever figured out how to develop it. It's called a dual control breath. Uh, but what it does is, let me see if I can show you. It starts out as a pressure controlled uh, a flow cycle, uh, but when you when it reaches its flow cycle uh, end, if the tidal volume is not achieved, it now uses a flow controlled application like a volume breath. So it starts out like a pressure support, ends up like a volume breath, and the volume is on the tail end to sort of top the gas tank off uh, to get up to that tidal volume. Uh, it's called dual control. Um, I have not used it, but it, it is sort of a half pressure control, the first part, uh, so I thought I'd share it with you. Thank you very much. I do not see one. I, I do not see Guillermo. Ah. Are we done? Yes. pregunta para el doctor Delinger? Bueno. Bien. Eh, si no hay ninguna pregunta, eh, agradecemos al doctor Delinger su participación y algunos anuncios parroquiales antes de ya clausurar. Se entre, eh, hay un premio que entregar, eh, el premio es el, el trabajo libre y es a la farmacocinética de los líquidos en choque hemorrágico, eh, cuyo primer autor es el doctor Gustavo Lugo. No está, por lo tanto no lo entregamos, pero es el ganador de los trabajos libres y bueno, ya le haremos llegar su, su premio y su reconocimiento. Eh, pues como han visto ha sido un curso con temas diferentes, metimos liderazgo, enseñanza, Incluso la parte económica, que creo que es algo que nos debe de involucrar cada día más a más como médicos participantes de un sistema de salud, así solamente hagamos medicina privada o solamente medicina institucional. Creo que todos debemos estar preocupados hacia dónde vamos. Estamos en una época de total incertidumbre, esa es la verdad. Y, sin embargo, deberíamos de cambiar a lo mejor el chip de esa angustia por la incertidumbre a esa oportunidad de poder crear durante la incertidumbre. Creo que eh, si analizamos la historia del mundo en las épocas de incertidumbre es cuando más se dan evoluciones y 
eh, incluso, bueno, la tecnología digital, los negocios, las llamadas empresas unicornios han, ser, han surgido durante esta incertidumbre. Entonces creo que tenemos una oportunidad preciosa. Eh, a veces el ánimo no nos deja cuando uno ve las, a veces la parte económica, pero creo que es una buena oportunidad de revolucionar incluso el sistema de salud desde su enseñanza, desde cómo practicarla y cómo hacer cosas de bajo costo con mejor calidad, que era un poco lo que decía el doctor Villarreal. Entonces, creo que ese es un poco el tono, o si sea, vamos a mover estos tipos de, de cursos de educación médica continua. Creo que como médicos debemos ser cada vez más partícipes de la evolución social de este y de todos los países. Así que, eh, como han visto, eso que vemos ahora con estos temas de liderazgo, enseñanza, eh, economía, planeación, y que creo que van a ser cada vez más a más y que esto lo vamos a implementar en una forma de, a lo mejor, talleres para todos ir cambiando y tener realmente una opinión como los que realmente somos los actores de cambio de para dónde vaya y no eh, recibir todo digerido. Eh, al, al igual, pues obviamente eh, hubo temas de gran calidad. Eh, los, las ponencias, el 60% a las que tuve oportunidad de oír, creo que fueron de excelente calidad. Agradezco evidentemente a ustedes la presencia, el estar aquí un año más. Lo esperamos el año que entra, eh, muy probable en nuestra nueva casa ya en el TEC. Y bueno, pues esperamos sus opiniones, sus críticas, siempre con el afán de mejorar y de aprovechar todas esas estos oportunidades de, de mejora, ¿no? Áreas de oportunidad, le dicen, y creo que tienen razón, tenemos áreas de oportunidad donde mejorar. Así que esto o sea, se concluye un año más, sin, además de las gracias a ustedes, a la industria farmacéutica, donde prácticamente sin ellos no podemos realizar este tipo de eventos que son costosos, a todo el staff del, del hospital, eh, secretarias, médicos de base, pasantes, residentes, que es un trabajo que se va tejiendo artesanal con la idea de bajar los costos también para poder seguir continuando, perdón, seguir con estos esfuerzos. Eh, el doctor Juan Gutiérrez, que ha sido el coordinador de todo este evento en la parte científica y logística, y obviamente a nuestros profesores nacionales. Así que muchísimas gracias, esperamos que hayan tenido algo que eh, agregar o incorporar a su práctica diana, eh, diaria. Y si no, pues eh, en el futuro no, entre todos lo podremos hacer. Muchas gracias y que tengan un buen fin de semana y lo esperamos el año próximo. Gracias.